I wonder if there's anybody here this morning who's really suffering with something. Now, you don't have to put your hand up, but in a, as a pastor, I can tell you that in a group of 50 people or so, there'll be some people who are really struggling this morning. Maybe you're struggling mentally and you're dealing with depression or anguish or mental illness. Maybe you're struggling um, and suffering maybe physically. Maybe there's some disease or sickness or some medical condition that you're dealing with. Or maybe you're suffering relationally. Maybe there's a relationship that you're involved in that's fragmenting. Or maybe you're at odds with your kids. Or maybe you're at strife with a close friend. Or maybe you're even suffering spiritually. Uh, you're totally confused about the spiritual life. Maybe you're not sure about your meaning in life. Maybe you're not sure about your spiritual status before God. Maybe you don't even know whether God really exists or not. Well, if that's for you, I dare say many people like that in our community, then I think this sermon will be for you today. Today we're going to look at one of the most intimate personal stories in the gospel. It's a story about um, Jesus and three of his closest friends. Interestingly, it's only recorded in this gospel in John. And I pray that this story will give you hope today. So let's get some background before you understand the story. You need some context. It's sometime close to Easter, 33 AD, and Jesus is in the last few weeks of his life. This is not long before he's murdered. And um, he's staying in a very remote part of town, east of Jerusalem. He's in the wilderness, actually. And one day, word gets to him that one of his dear friends, in fact, one of his followers, one of his disciples, not the 12, but one of his disciples, is very, very sick. Now, Jesus knows this family in this place called Bethany, about two miles east of Jerusalem. Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Jesus is really good friends with these people. And we see later on that the writer of the gospel helps us helps us understand the context. He, he says he really loves these people. So for the last three years, these three people, amongst many others, have been absolutely devoted to Jesus. And they've shown their allegiance to Jesus. They kill, call him Lord. They call him, recognize him as God. And they recognize that he's God in human form. And in fact, in another place, it's recorded that one of the three kids... Mary, she went to Jesus and poured expensive oil on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. I mean, that is a pure act of devotion, recognising him as God. And the writer makes sure for us to understand that Jesus really loves these people. They are close friends of his. So it's really, really important that you understand the context. Jesus loves these people. So I want to give you three illustrations, th three conclusions from um, the story today, from this illustration, to see what we can learn. Now, you've got the text in front of you. Those of you who are regulars, you'll have your Bible with you. But if you don't, you can see the text on page five and the notes on page six. In verse one, we read, that a man named Lazarus was sick and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. And notice that this is the Mary who poured the perfume on Jesus' feet. Let me start by saying everybody at some point of their life suffers. So if you're a regular to this church, you know the answer to this really easy. 95% of all the people in the world have struggled with suffering at some point and the other 5% are... Liars. You get it. We all struggle. Everybody has suffering in their life. The question, of course, is 
why would a loving God allow suffering in the world? Why does God, who is pure love and in human form Jesus, why do babies get cancer? And why are there wars? And why are all these terrible things happening in the world? How do you reconcile that? Suffering is part of the human condition. If you've never suffered, you're not human. Now, there is another human condition that has plagued the human race. It's called rebelliousness. I don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> Read the hand. It's not going to do what you want it to do. I hate being told what to do. I'm not going to... God's not telling me what to do. In fact, if you're married, you probably have had that conversation with your wife or your husband or your kids. There is this other human condition called rebelliousness. Human beings are rebellious. We hate being told what to, what to do. Um, tell me if I'm not right. <laughs> We're right, all right? The result is that we like to live our life the way we decide it should be. No one's going to tell me how to live my life, including God. God's not going to tell me how to live life. I've got a plan in my mind and I'm going to live life my way and no one's going to tell me what to do, including God. Now, sometimes as a result of living your life your own way, sometimes your suffering is simply a result of the consequences of your rebellious actions. Now, you probably don't know anything about that, but I lived a life of rebellious actions before I became a Christian. It was drugs, sex and funk music back then and rock and roll and a life of partying and sex and drugs. You reap the consequences of that when you get older. Now, some of you probably know nothing about that. But let me tell you that as you get older, the consequences of that lifestyle is sometimes loneliness, guilt, isolation, strained relationships and family breakdown. Consequences of your actions, consequences of my actions. But there's another reason why people have suffering in their life. There's another reason why God allows you, this loving God, there's another reason why this loving God allows you to suffer and allows me to suffer. What would you do if I told you that sickness is a sacred thing? It's one of God's great ordinances. What would you do if I told you that? Now, of course, Jesus has power over all diseases. He could have prevented the disease that Lazarus was dying from easy if that was part of his plan. But you see, folks, there's a strange link between our bodies and our souls. Something that affects the body will often have an impact on your mind and your soul. In other words, sickness and suffering is one way that God can use to get our attention. When you're sick and you're seriously sick, it tends to re reorient life's priorities. You start thinking about other things. And that sickness can begin to teach us something about ourselves. The suffering can teach you something about yourself that you wouldn't otherwise learn. You live your life on the mountaintop and all you get is a suntan. But if you are travelling through the valley of the shadow of death, you could actually learn something about yourself, about life and the world in which you're navigating. Sickness and suffering 
is often the only way God can teach you something. It's the only way he can get your attention. Suffering is one of the best antidotes to the condition of rebelliousness. If you're a rebellious human being, because God loves you and he wants to reveal something to you, a truth to you, and you're not listening, which is like most of the world in which we live, if he loves you enough, he will allow you to go through something so difficult that you'll reorient the way you think and start paying attention to the spiritual part of life. When you're at the end of your life, g'day folks, come and have a seat. When you're at the end of your life and you're suffering, that's when God could be the closest to you. Do you realise that? When you're close to the end of your life and you're suffering, that's when God could be the closest to you. Let me tell you something as an aside. I'll make a political comment now. This maid system that we have in BC, medical assistance in dying, which started with, when you're terminally ill, we'll give you the injection. Now the government is proposing that we move it from not just terminally ill, but if you're depressed, we'll give you the injection. If you're mentally ill, that's the most evil thing that has ever happened to the province of BC. And I'll tell you why. I'm a pastor. I'm with people when they're dying. When people die, sometimes God reveals himself to them in their suffering. Amen. And they find hope of life just before they die. And you're going to take that hope away from people? That's evil. And so I want to say to you that your suffering... No matter how bad it is, there's no justification for taking your life because God will use it to speak to you. Imagine this, you get suffering all your life and God reveals himself to you and then for the rest of eternity, you live in complete joy and peace with God. Or what about you get healed, you get your healing, you die quickly and you spend the rest of eternity without God, that is a bad thing, whichever way you cut it. When you're at the end of your life and you're suffering, God can be the closest to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, the way you handle your suffering in Christ is a testimony to the people around you. How many of you know people who've been very, very sick and dying And they have a victory of life because of what God is revealing to them. The old bishop, Bishop Ryle, who I read on this passage, he said, God does not go away when bodily health goes away. Christ doesn't depart when life departs. Now, the title of my sermon today is The Purpose of Pain. Those of you who are C.S. Lewis fans know that he wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. This is what C.S. Lewis writes about pain and suffering. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers in our pleasure. He speaks in our conscience but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God uses pain and suffering to get your attention. So here's the first thing I want you to write down on page six. If you're taking notes, I've written down there, God speaks to us in our suffering. You can write that down. God speaks to us in our suffering. If you don't hear God in your suffering, you're not listening because he's shouting to you. Now, I know what you want. You want the suffering to stop. Oh, yeah. Who wants to keep suffering? Who wants to die a very painful death? Nobody. 
Who wants to spend eternity with God with no pain and no suffering anymore for eternity? Uh, that would be me. So we get to verse 3 in our passage today. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Lazarus is really sick. He looks like he's going to die. So the sisters send, they go east where they know Jesus is staying and they go and tell Jesus their loved one is sick. Here's the perfect example of what you and I should do when we're suffering. At once, the sisters brought the matter to Jesus. Now, Jesus, they said, we know that you absolutely love us. And you need to understand that Jesus loves every human being that ever lived and ever will live. Doesn't matter what you believe, even if you don't believe in God, He still loves you. He loves every human being. And frankly, it doesn't matter where you get your identity from, how you live your life, uh, whether you're into drugs, sex and rock and roll, Jesus loves you absolutely. And so they who were followers of Jesus, they went to him and said, Jesus, we know that you absolutely love us, but we want to let you know that our dear brother Lazarus is really sick. Now, you notice they didn't go to him like so many church people do when they go to Jesus and say, will you do something? Will you heal him? Will you come at once? Why is he sick? Why is this happening to him? Now, this is what you need to do, Jesus. And then we give a long litany of what he's supposed to do. Isn't it funny? We always got advice for God. No, they simply came to Jesus and they told him, what was happening and they left Jesus to decide what to do if you haven't worked this out Jesus knows exactly what to do in every situation for all of life including your life and my life he knows exactly what to do and remember he loves you way more than you ever loved him his love for you and me has never changed. It never changes. Yet our love for him is often wavering and uncertain. So here's the next thing. Point number two, the best thing you can do, the best thing we can do in our suffering is bring it to Jesus. Just bring it to him. I don't believe in Jesus. Bring it to him anyway. See what happens. No, I think it's another God. Okay, well you, you, you do that. I suggest you still bring it to Jesus. So then we get to the last part of the reading, verses 4, 5 and 6. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness isn't going to end in death. No, it's for God's glory. So that the Son might be glorified him. And if you read in the text here, verse 5, when Jesus said that, that would sound like really callous. What do you mean you're not coming? Verse 5, John has to write again to remind us, now Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He had to remind us that he really loved these people and that Jesus was making a statement about their suffering. And so we read, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed in the town two more days. He didn't come immediately. What does Jesus do when he hears about your suffering? Oh, he heals you straight away and it all goes away and the whole world is a nice place. <laughs> no. Nope. He stayed in this town, where in, this, in, the, in the countryside where he was, for another two days. Was this because Jesus didn't care about these people? No. He loved this family. He was made really clear in the text that these were devoted disciples of Jesus and he loved them, but he didn't come. Why? 
because he had a much bigger plan in mind. I mean, a bigger plan? What do you mean? What could be bigger than healing Lazarus? Well, if you're a Christian and you know this story, there is something bigger than healing Lazarus. A couple of days later, so it's four days now, Jesus arrives in Bethany. Mary and Martha are weeping. Their brother died. How can Jesus help in my suffering? Well, anybody know what happened to Lazarus? He was raised from the dead. Well, that wasn't in my paradigm. You see, when you hand stuff to Jesus, he can do things that you can't even imagine. And it may not be to heal you of your sickness. It may be revealed to you something spiritually that's so important that when you die, you're going to have that with the rest of you for eternity. Or it may be to touch somebody else. Lazarus was raised back to life. Now, that's a bit of a bummer because he had to die again at the end of his life. He wasn't resurrected like Jesus was. He was resuscitated back to life. But no one could have imagined that. You and I know that because of hindsight. We've got the story. We know the story. But you imagine being there 2,000 years ago in that town and Jesus died. And we love you, Jesus. And we came to you and we told you our brother was sick and you didn't do anything. Now, you never said that to Jesus, but I've said that to him on several occasions when I've been really struggling with stuff. Where are you? How come you're not helping me? Wow. They never imagined that Lazarus could be raised from the dead. Now, God could have prevented this death. He could have stopped it really easy. In fact, it's fair to say that God doesn't love it or doesn't even like it when his creatures, his people, the human race suffers. He hates that. He hates when people suffer. But God understands and knows that us human beings are struggling with a human condition called rebelliousness. And let me tell you, you look at the world around in which you live where people are not in touch with their suffering. They're suffering, trust me. I go visit homes, I know. On the outside, they got a nice suit and they present really well. Pretty well everybody out there is suffering, but they maintain this level of distraction. They wouldn't even consider God. It's amazing how resilient people in Western Canada are to hearing the voice of God. It's amazing. So God knows because he loves people so much, he knows this problem of the human condition of rebelliousness and he'll do whatever it takes to get their attention. Have a life, nice life now. Don't bother me with God and then you've got to die. I don't believe in that stuff after death. Okay, you may not. After you die, you're going to find out. A lot of people are going to be wrong about that. So, Bishop Peter, why do you think so many idiots are resistant? You tell us, because I, I know you know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, let me put it back. Ed, why do you think so many Canadians are resistant? Christians are resistant. We want to do it our own way. Because we want to do it our own way. We've got this rebellious nature. I've got a way to live my life way better than anybody else. Christians are resistant. Hey, folks, come and join us. It's a picnic. There's a couple of seats up here. A 50 buck seats are up the front of you. <laughs> so God, okay, focus now. This is really, really important. God will do what it takes to get your attention so that after you die, you'll have a life that could be impossible to imagine down here. 
suffering and sickness is often the only means by which God can deal with our rebellious nature. And He loves you and me so much that He's willing to persist with you in revealing Himself to you, even if you don't want to hear it. He wants to reveal Himself to you. And after you die, you'll see that everything that God did and everything that God allowed on the earth was done perfectly. And there was a reason for it. All those babies dying of cancer, all the wars, all the floods, all the natural disasters, all the... Oh, by the way, natural disasters. Anybody know that we've got fires in northern BC? Okay. It's pretty bad, right? Anybody prayed for the souls of the people so that people will pay attention to God in this? And maybe through this suffering, people will turn to God? Because people have got their faith in their hose. Are you kidding me? And then you're going to die anyway. Maybe God's trying to get our attention. Pay attention to your spiritual life. Now, as we would say in Australia, she'll be right, mate. Yeah, till you die. What about your quality of life? Don't get me started on that one. God will persist with, with, with you and get your attention. Do you think if God gave you a million dollars, you'd pay attention to him? Nah, you'd get distracted. The only way he can get our attention usually is sickness and suffering. So here's point number three that you can write down on page number six. God knows what is best and what to do. And what to do and what time to do things for those who come to him. God knows what is best and at what time to do things for those who come to him. He knows how to handle it and it's his timing. He stayed two days extra before he came to Bethany. It was four days after he got there and Lazarus was dead. Well, let me finish. You know the story. If you've been around church for a long time, you know the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Lazarus dies and four days later, Jesus brings him to life. But Jesus had something in mind that the people of Bethany could never have imagined. This was for the glory of God. This was for God to be revealed. God had something good and holy in mind that they could never have even imagined. There's a reason why Jesus called, is called a physician. He's the wisest physician and he never makes mistakes in the diagnosis and prognosis. All you need to do is listen to him. You have your struggles and suffering. You understand he's speaking to you. You take it to him. Don't tell him what to do. Here's my struggles. And you pay attention to what he's teaching you and trust that he knows the best time when to do things. That may be that you die. If you're a wise person, you'll understand that death is not the end. Now, you follow him. You do what he tells you and you'll live a life of great peace no matter what you're suffering and struggling through. But he's got to deal with your rebelliousness. You're your worst enemy. I'm my worst enemy. I know what I'm going to do with my life. I know way better than God. I'm much smarter than God. I want to do it my way. Here, I'll give you a little clue. The familiarity of your pain is less scary than the unfamiliarity of your healing. Did you hear that? The familiarity of your pain is way less scary 
than the unfamiliarity of your healing and wholeness. So to live in your pain is much more familiar. It's too scary for some of us to go to wholeness of human being as we were created to be. But if you're willing to do that, you'll discover a wholeness and a peace that you cannot create yourself. And by the way, let me close with this. Have you ever considered what price Jesus had to pay in order to bring Lazarus back to life again? Have you ever thought what it cost Jesus? He came to the town, he brought Lazarus back to life again, and there were a bunch of people in that town and in Jerusalem who hated his guts. There are lots of people who don't like the sermon I'm preaching today. And if you read in the next chapter of John, spoiler alert, we're going to get to this in a few weeks. If you read in the next chapter of John, we read in verse 9 of chapter 12. Meanwhile, a la large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So the chief priests, this is the religious leaders, the PhDs in religion, the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well as Jesus. Because on account of Jesus, many of the Jews were going over to him. So the religious leaders wanted to kill Lazarus, who was just raised from the dead, and Jesus because he raised him from the dead. <laughs> That's the response of the world. The religious people, the people who don't know God, they want to just kill Jesus. So let me leave you with these three points. Number one, God will speak to you in your suffering. The best thing you can do in your suffering is bring it to Jesus. He's the man who is God. There's only one man ever lived, God in human form. His name is Jesus. That's what he said he was. He's, he's not a prophet. He's God in human form. Bring it to him. And then trust that he knows what's the best thing to do and the best time in which to do it. And I will guarantee you 110% after you die, you will find out that he did the right thing if you listen to him. So for those of you who are here today and struggling and suffering, either mentally, physically, relationally or spiritually, I'd like to say a prayer for you if you'll allow me. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you that you are very, very real to us. And we pray in Jesus' name that you would reveal yourself to us, especially in our struggles and sufferings and sickness. We bring them to you. And we trust you that you will know what's best to do. We promise to follow you and to listen to you and we'll leave all the rest of the details to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.